Okay. You ready? Okay, good. Good afternoon, and welcome to the uh, panel discussion, How Historical Mystery Writers Bring the Past to Life One Murder at a Time. We have three best-selling uh, historical mystery writers with us today. We have Mally Becker, who's going to moderate the discussion, and we have Mariah Fredericks and Anna Maria Alfieri. Okay. They're all members of the New York chapter of the Mystery Writers of America. Anna Maria, uh, her most current historical mystery is Invisible Country, which she has copies right here with her. Uh, she also wrote uh, Blood Tango, City of Silver, which was her debut historical novel, um, as well as the British East Africa series, Strange Gods, The Idols of Mombasa, and The Blasphemers. And she's also written five nonfiction books about business subjects under the name Patricia King. Maria Frederick's new novel is uh, Lindbergh Nanny, and she has a copy of that. With, that's coming out when? You said? Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> coming out soon. Okay. It was just picked up by uh, Good Morning America. They promoted it on Good Morning America. As if, when, uh, the best buys of the, of the fall, the holiday season, I guess. What you want to bring with you on the holidays. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. She's also the author of the Jane Prescott mystery series, which includes uh, A Death of No Importance, A Death of a New American. Death of American Beauty, and Death of a Showman. And Mally Becker has written a Revolutionary War mystery series, uh, which continues with The Counterfeit Wife. She has a copy of that here with her, but she'll be selling and signing afterwards. And the debut novel was The Turncoat's Widow. So please welcome Mally Becker, Mariak Fredericks, and Anna Maria Alfieri. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for coming out on a beautiful Saturday afternoon in November. This is uh, great to have you here. Um, we're gonna hold this uh, panel discussion as a real conversation, uh, and then we'll leave time for questions. But before we start, just so we can calibrate the discussion, how, how many of you are writers or, or working on writing? Okay, so, so you're all readers which is even, even better. Um, <laughs> um, someone in the audience just said no competition. The, the nice thing about writing is that there's, there are no readers I know of who only read one book. Um, so the mystery writing community is, is a really warm, welcoming uh, place to be. But I, I'm gonna start by asking Anna Maria and Mariah to uh, give us a quick, uh, they call it an elevator pitch, a uh, minute or two summary of their fabulous books. So I'm going to start with Mariah. America's most famous kidnapping through the eyes of one of its prime suspects, a young Scottish woman who was otherwise known as the Lindbergh Nanny. Uh, I have uh, six books that are out. Uh, the latest uh, one to, uh, to launch is uh, the paperback of Invisible Country, and it's Paraguay in 1868. And it's a time machine to a beautiful place uh, during a devastating war. But it isn't all grim and awful. There's romance. Uh, they're, they're kind of... Uh, uh, three funny old men uh, doing strange things. So it's it's entertaining, I think. Um, but it is against um, the background of of a war. Well, I, I know I said short, but that was too short for both of you. Um, I, I finished Invisible Country last night, and I really enjoyed it. And it ends on a note of hope and redemption. And I'm not gonna, that would be a real spoiler. Um, and Mariah just happened not to mention that uh, the Lindbergh Nanny is reviewed in the New York Times book review section. So you can see that online now or tomorrow on paper. Um, my, my two books are uh, part of a Revolutionary War mystery series. The new one, The Counterfeit Wife, uh, tells the story of my two protagonists, Becca Parcell and Daniel Alloway, 
who find themselves uh, accepting a second mission from General George Washington and in Philadelphia masquerading as newlyweds uh, in search of counterfeiters who are flooding the economy with fake money. And why, why masquerade as newlyweds? Because in the 18th century, uh, in polite society, a man and woman who were not married or related by family, uh, would, would, it would be unacceptable for them to be alone together without a chaperone. And Becca and Daniel need to trade clues and thoughts about all their suspects. So um, in any case, what you, you both write in very different time periods, um, but what particularly sparked your ideas for, for the novels you've just told us about? Um, well, in my case, I, uh, I had been writing a series set in 1910s uh, New York, and it featured a lady's maid. And COVID was a little tough on series. And uh, so my publisher said, would you like to try a historical standalone, you know, a sort of uh, book that's uh, in and of itself. And I thought, oh, man, you know, what? could I write about that would be so intrinsically interesting that my name on the cover, which clearly not enough people care about, uh, would be enough to have people say, you know, that, I want to buy that. And I started swatting servants into you know, big events in history, and I thought, okay, well, we could do a violinist on the Titanic, or we could do the chauffeur who was driving Franz Ferdinand when he was assassinated. And then I remembered, you know, neither of those things are mysteries. There's not a lot of questions about what happened in those uh, events. And then I remembered Murder on the Orient Express. And if you've seen the 1974 film, you'll recall that it opens with a silent scene of the kidnapping of little Daisy Armstrong. And as the kidnapper goes through the house, it's not the parents that he runs into, it's the servants. And the first person that you see is the nurse on the floor tied up. And I knew that that had the, that Agatha Christie had been inspired by the Lindbergh kidnapping. And I thought, was that nurse an actual person? You know, if she was, what happened to her? And a quick Google search revealed that, yes, her name was Betty Gao. She had been in the country for maybe a few years. She never thought she'd get the job with the Lindbergh. She wasn't that experienced. Um, and they interviewed her um, in Anne's mother's house in Englewood. Um, and... I thought, you know, she's just a footnote in a police report, you know, interviewed Nanny as to what the baby was wearing. That won't be that interesting. But it turns out that she was a suspect, her boyfriend was a suspect, and several members of the staff were also suspects because the police strongly suspected that it was an inside job. So I called my agent and I said, I think this is the idea for the next book. She said, yeah, I think so too. Um, so yeah, <laughs> so that's how uh, we arrived with the Lindbergh Miami. We have two of these, does this work? Yes, okay, that way uh, you'll listen to a little less clunking as they go along. Uh, actually, Invisible Country was my uh, my second novel. It's out in paperback now. It was only hardcover before. And it really inspired me, uh, and I thought it was going to be my first book, because a friend of mine who work, was working for USAID in Paraguay told me that right after our Civil War, Paraguay fought the most... Um, uh, uh, the awfulest war in, ever, in South American history, the most devastating one. And it was Paraguay against Uruguay. Well, that made sense. But not only Uruguay, also Brazil and Argentina, the two largest countries on that continent. And I thought, little Paraguay against 
all of that. Why were they doing that? And he said, he told me that there was a dictator who was in charge and that 90% of the male population of Paraguay perished in that war. Uh, there were no men, uh, but just about no men between the ages of eight and 80 uh, when the war was over. And he said to me, my friend Steve, that the priests were so were so clearly aware of the fact that this that these was a this was a people they, these were people who whose culture and uh, and their uh, future was completely destroyed that there would be no more Guarani uh, in in the world anymore. So what a pre what the priest uh, did was to go to the pulpit and tell the their parishioners, mostly women, that they should get pregnant any way they could and, and ignore the laws of the church concerning marriage. Uh, I went to Catholic school for 17 years, and I knew that this was radical. <laughs> this was really radical. So, and I thought, uh, and so I, I had that in my head, and I was beginning to research it. Uh, Another idea came along, and I uh, and this became my second uh, my second novel. But it begins that way. There is a priest, Padre Gregorio. He uh, goes. He's going to the pulpit, uh, and he tells his he gives that message to his congregation. It causes a, 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 a you can imagine an enormous response. He would ordinarily have gone to the door of the church and greeted his parishioners after mass that Sunday morning, but he snuck, he sneaks out because he can't face them yet. Uh, he, he's a little afraid of what they're going to say. And so he sneaks out and he goes out through the campanile, through the, uh, through the bell tower and, and, uh, and it's dark and he, and he trips over something and he opens the door for the light to come in and what he tripped over is the body of one of the most important men, one of the most powerful men in the country. And so, uh, and because this powerful person has been killed uh, the, and the dictator is mad, uh, they have to, the villagers have to figure out who, who, uh, who killed uh, Ricardo Yote and they have to work as a team uh, to do that because they know that uh, somebody is going to get blamed whether that person is guilty or not. So they need to find the guilty party. I, I know I should talk about my book and what the spark for it was, but both of you, I'll, I'll get there. Both of you write about women who don't have power in their society um, and, and who are forced to face uh, complex um, challenges outside their control. Is that something you knew you were doing in the beginning? Is it something you do over and over again in your fiction? Um, well, I always think that the idea for Jane Prescott came from a obsession with I, Claudius, which if, I don't know if you remember it, um, the novel and the television series. I, I binge watched it during COVID. <laughs> right, right. And you know, Claudius is a, a member of the Imperial Roman family, but because he's he's lame and he has a stammer, people overlooked him, and he's the one who survives as his you know generations of his family stab and murder and poison each other. Um, and I'm fascinated maybe because I have a mild speech defect as a kid, what, what the people who stand in the corner uh, and are overlooked can observe. Um, and I also just relate a lot more to the servant class than the, than the uh, aristocrats, so. Uh, for me, it's, it, it's different. I, I think it just came out that way because I, you know, I uh, graduated uh, from college into the feminism of the of the sixties, and I was a warrior for women's rights on Wall Street in uh, in my life, and I, I think they just my my stories just come out that way. What I really start with is places. Um, 
I f fall in love with places. And the reason Invisible Country, I had, I, I fell in love with Paraguay after I started to write that book. But the other ones are, were all inspired by places. Uh, Potosi, which is, uh, uh, was in 1650, the richest city on earth, the largest city in the Western Hemisphere was the same size as London, and it was the most powerful economic city on the planet. And I'm a pretty well-educated person. I had never heard of it. So when I went there, it was astonishingly beautiful and interesting, and it's at 13,500 feet, so it's quite a place. And it was that, and then I got into the I got into the history of it, and and uh, yeah. and that's where. So it's, I fell in love with Africa, and I could, I knew I could write a series about it because keeping my imagination in in British East Africa uh, was a, a wonderful thing I would want to do. I'm I'm going to cherry pick um, from both of your answers. Um, I'm I'm fascinated by things I don't know about history. That's that's what sparks my stories. Um, and, and I, my characters or my favorite characters are the ones who are ignored, um, and hear things maybe they wouldn't if, if they were more aristocratic. Um, so I didn't intend to write a book. I was an attorney and I volunteered at the Morristown National Historical Park. And of course I thought I was going to be clearing trails and that's what I wanted to do. And they, um, they assigned me to the archives instead. I thought, don't you think I can? Anyway, um, I found a document dated 1780. That's the middle of the American Revolution. And it was an indictment of a um, poor schlub of a farmer in Middlesex County uh, for the crime of traveling from New Jersey to New York City, the phrase was, without permission or passport. And I, I grew up in and around New York City, and for whatever reason, this really offended me, the idea that you couldn't go to New York. Uh, so I took it to the park historian and said, what the heck is this? And in much more academic terms, terms he basically said, oh, honey, sit down. Let me tell you about the real revolution. He said, Historians believe less than 50% of the population here supported independence, maybe just one third. One third uh, supported the king and the final third was just too busy trying to survive to uh, give a hoot who won the war for independence. Um, this was just around the time of one of the last elections, I won't say which, um, and divisions in our country were, were cracking wide open and I started playing a, the writer's game of what if without knowing that's what I was doing. What if I was one of those women and, oh, and I of course left out the most important part, which was, and so many people were spying for the British in New Jersey and carrying secrets into British held New York City or smuggling that the governor made it a crime to go there. So I imagined what if I was one of these women just trying to survive? What if my husband was one of those spies? And that was the start of um, my debut novel, The Turncoat's Widow. Um, and I, I went from there. Uh, for the second novel, I looked into uh, Philadelphia because the British actually occupied Philadelphia. Um, and we see that as a footnote or a blip now but what did it mean to the people who lived there when the British left? How, how distrustful and angry were they? And the answer was, yeah, pretty, pretty angry. Um, so that's the background of my second book. Uh, I'm wondering, because I, I have a particular thought about this. Uh, uh, I have a particular thought about this. Uh, and I want to ask both of you, did you love history when you were studying in school? Absolutely. I was a history major. I mean, I went fully intending to be an English major. Um, but I was like, oh, that's too obvious. I'm going to go for history. Um, I, all the best stories are in history, I think. Same. His, history and English major. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's just... 
the thing that intrigues me the most is how the myths of our history change, what gets, it, it's not that history changes, it's the questions we ask of history. Yeah, change, and, ha and, and ha how we react. I'm the opposite. I'm, I'm the outlier on this. Uh, and I guess it's why I was, uh, I was intrigued because I hated history in school. And I, <laughs> and, and now looking back on it, as much as I, I'm a, uh, I love what I do, I just love doing it. Uh, but my problem was the way it was taught to me. You know, I had to memorize the causes of the Hundred Years' War in order to pass an examination. <laughs> and, and I can probably still name two of them, uh, even though I, that exam was uh, uh, back in, uh, during the Peloponnesian War. Uh, but I, I loved historical fiction. Uh, I, when I was uh, in high school, my mother had a book out of the Patterson Public Library uh, called Catherine, and it was uh, about uh, uh, Catherine and John of Gaunt, and she became the mother of four kings of England, and I, I loved that book, and then I started, so I started reading historical fiction, and, uh, and so I, 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 became, uh, and I cannot, people say, oh, you write historicals. Uh, other uh, friends of ours in, in, in the mystery writers group um, say, oh, you have to do all that research. I don't, I love my research. Mm -hmm. Don't you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. How much of your research do you have to throw out when, when you're writing, or how, how much do you use compared with how much you throw out? Uh, 10%, <laughs> if that. Uh, but I, I wrote, I write a blog. I write a blog with other, uh, uh, a group of other writers. And uh, that's what blogs are for. Uh, you, what goes on the cutting room floor, floor goes into, what do you do with goes on to what goes on? In oh, well, with, with the Jane Prescott's, I always try to pick a, a particular event of the year. Um, I write from 1910 to 1917, I'm hoping. Um, you know, either the Triangle Fire or the Armory Show. And once I had the plot set, I'd start writing, I'd fill in, do lots of research on what this building looked like uh, later. Um, but with the Lindbergh Mammy, um, it's such a well-known case. The details are so, you know, picked over on websites even to this day. And I do have a nice uh, research story um, with this, which is um, I started, I think, just after COVID, we all went into lockdown. And I thought, well, obviously the New York Jersey State Police Museum where they have all the archives, it'll open at some point. I don't have to rush. And um, of somebody I met at an MWA meeting um, said, hey, I saw the announcement in Publishers Weekly that you're doing this. Do you want the digital police files? And I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> I <laughs> And, you know, it was all of the statements, all of the interviews with all of the staff and the newspapers, of course, carried, um, you know, the trial transcripts. So that was just, and we were talking about how nice the mystery community is. As a, as a fellow researcher and writer, for him to do that for me was just so generous because I, I thought the museum was going to open. It never did during my, the entire time of writing. I would have been lost. The, the nice thing about choosing a smaller character is it focuses the narrative. So I knew what I was looking for, but so I didn't have to lose a lot of research, but I, I sympathize. I have a research story. <laughs> a, a historian was nice enough to read um, a draft of The Turncoat's Widow. And I only made two factual errors, which I've corrected and will never mention out loud. Um, but he said to me, I don't like your George Washington. He's really stiff. As a matter of fact, he looks like he ate something that didn't agree with him. And everyone does that. And he went off on a rant. And I realized he was right. I was so scared of, of writing George Washington that I, I made him look like those paintings. Um, but then I found 
uh, the two only remaining letters to Martha Washington that exist because Martha uh, burned them all before she died. She thought she had. These two were stuck behind a drawer that her niece inherited. And they had been married. Um, they were middle-aged. They'd been married quite a while. And this was 1775. And the prior week, he had George Washington had been named the leader of the United Forces. The war was just getting started. And he's writing her a letter to explain why he can't come back to Virginia. He's off to Boston. And he starts out with very flowery language and how much he'll miss her. And I'm an attorney and I thought, yeah, the talk is cheap. And, uh, but there's a PS. And the PS for one of the two letters was, I have uh, purchased material suiting for you to make two gowns. I hope you, in, I hope they agree with you, and I'm getting the exact language wrong, but I thought we all know um, or are people who have been promoted, um, you know, who have been or wined and dined others who are important. And here's George Washington in Philadelphia with all the founders who were probably uh, jockeying for position with him. And he takes the time to buy cloth for his longtime wife to make dresses. That would be and, pretty odd. Wouldn't, wouldn't Martha look lovely? In and that, like centers, that to me was oh, romantic. Oh. And uh, I added her as a character in the first book so that he could have some softer moments. Mm, nice. So so that's that's my research moment. But um, other other problems historical mystery writers have. And one of one of the main ones I think, or that I wrestle with is you know, culture changes over time. So how do you make your characters true to their times, but also relatable to a 21st century audience? I had the most trouble with that uh, in my Africa series. It takes place in uh, British East Africa starting in, in 1911, and three of the books uh, are out. And there's one more uh, in, in the pipeline for publication and the fifth one I'm working on now. And, uh, and but it's, I, I write a lot about colonialism uh, and uh, because uh, it, it fascinates me uh, what happens to the people who are already there. And, and so I chose that era because it is a time in colonialism that's fraught with, uh, with difficulties. Uh, the missionaries have been there for a while. The indigenous people, the tribal people have been there for millennia. And, and the, um, the administrators, the king's empire builders have been there for about 20 years. And now the settlers are moving in. And so and there's there are clashes between all these groups of people. So there's a lot of reasons for people to kill one another. And so that's a good thing if you're going, if you're doing a, if you're doing a series, but I didn't want it to be the good old days of colonialism because I'm a 21st century uh, woman who's very sensitive to what colonialism has done to this earth. And so I invented three characters who have a reason to have a different point of view. And uh, there's, um, there's Vera Tolliver. She's the daughter of a missionary and she grew up with Kikuyu children and she knows more about being a Kikuyu than she does about being uh, a, 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 a proper Scottish young lady. Uh, there's uh, Justin Tolliver, who's the son of, a, of an Earl and he's been in the military and he, uh, he has, he's both uh, an aristocrat and an administrator. And these are people who are in, uh, and so he's got his own point of view. And, and then there's um, my favorite Quay, uh, Quay uh, Labazo. And Quay is half Kukuyu and half Maasai. And neither, tr neither tribe has uh, accepted him. So he, goes into the 
to the police force. He's an Ascari, but he, is, he isn't white <laughs> and he, he doesn't belong to any of the tribes. So he learns about justice and he serves justice. So they're all looking at what's going on. And that lets me be 21st century in my, uh, in my point of view. Well, with the, with the Ladies Maid series, I did one major ask of the readers, which is please believe that this wealthy family will entrust uh, their various murders to be solved by their maid. Um, and, but beyond that, I tried to, I tried to be honest about what the mindset was and what the limitations were because I'm sort of of the school of history of I like all the wrong in our history. I don't love um, the nostalgia and was it all you know so much better and so much prettier and more polite back then. You know I enjoy the mess. Um, you know having said that, there are things that I have um, removed from books because they would be a slap in the face to a reader, potentially. Um, and people, I think, I mean, I've wrestled with it, um, but there are times that I have um, reminded myself people are coming to these books for entertainment. They don't want um, to feel insulted or to, I feel like my point of view would be very clear and that I would have the reader's trust. I, you know, you can't be clear, sure. Um, with Lindbergh Nami, it was very easy because I, Betty in real life transgressed um, in certain ways. She got busted parking in the Palisades uh, for, <laughs> for, for nude behavior. Um, and that was part of her narrative. So that was, she was authentically an outlier in, the, in that way. Um, Charles Lindbergh, maybe we'll get to that later, obviously, um, is also, uh, you can present him authentically um, and, with diff and, and discuss the difficulties of the history at the time. I, I think one of the things we all do is um, present the world through the eyes of, of at least some characters who are outsiders. And, and we're the outsiders in history. So, so I think we, you know, we can step into the shoes of those characters in particular. Um, so in, in my book, um, books, <laughs> it's hard to believe there's more than one. Um, the main character, Becca, was raised poor in the hills of Northwest New Jersey when it was basically forest and her father discovers iron ore, which actually was in Northwest New Jersey. And, and suddenly they have money, but she can't dance the minuet and she doesn't know how she's supposed to act in polite society. And that gives her a little more space. Um, and she feels terrible when she realizes she's made mistakes, but um, she still makes them. So that's, that's how I've handled it. Um, but, Anna Maria, you mentioned murder finally, and un enough enough with the history. Um, we we write murder mysteries, and presumably none of us have committed murder. Um, and I won't I won't make assumptions. Um, so how do you step into the shoes or mind of a killer and create that character? I don't do it on purpose. <laughs> um, I, I don't like, his, I love historical fiction, but I don't like it if it's like Gone with the Wind, where there's a page and a half of story and you could draw a red line, and then there's two pages of history, and then you could draw another line, and then there's three pages of story. I want it all. So, so. I don't think about who the murderer is. Sometimes I really don't even know who the murderer is. Um, but I know who the dead body is. And, uh, and, and I choose a dead body uh, that will allow me to, in solving the murder, weave the history in. 
So it's all braided together and you can't really take it apart. So just as an example, um, you mentioned Blood Tango. Uh, it takes place in Buenos Aires in 1945. And it's about the most dramatic week in Argentine history. Uh, and it's about Juan Perón's career. But uh, so what I did was I murdered uh, a 16 year old uh, girl who is the body double for Evita. She works for Evita's dressmaker and her dressmaker discovers that she's exactly the same size. So she fits Evita's clothing on her and uh, she, the girl begins to, she worships Evita and she dresses up like her and she is killed. And then the question is, did somebody want to kill Evita or is there another reason why this young person has, has been murdered? Uh, eventually I figured out who killed her, uh, but I don't pick, I don't pick the killer first. So you're a pantser. I sure am, I sure am. Plotters versus pantsers. Uh, I'm, I'm a pawnser. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, we should tell people. Uh, there, there, there are pantsers like me who really don't know what the story is. We create the characters and we put them on the uh, into a situation. And then wh what it feels like to me is, um, I watch what they do and I write down what they say. So I just describe what they do and I write down what they say and eventually they solve the mystery. Just. <laughs> um, whereas plotters write out a full outline chapter by chapter and here they discover X and there they discover Y and here's your secondary murder and um, you know, you, you, you get the idea. Um, I, I truly believe that everybody is capable of murder, given the right circumstances. It's a, a core belief of mine. Um, and in the series I write about the that late... Makes me want to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it's not, I don't, I, I, it's important for me as a writer not to hold the worst of human nature at a distance, because um, I just, I like to look at it. Um, but so with the Gilded Age, the late Gilded Age, you know, as you were saying, it's, there are points in American history where the divisions are so intense, um, and you have a lot of different groups experiencing each other as an existential threat. You can have, you know, native versus immigrant men and women, uh, people of color demanding more space and voice in the public sphere, you know, owners versus workers. So there's, as you say, a, a huge array of motives and fear and narcissism to, uh, to work with. And when thinking about the person uh, who is the inside uh, collaborator with the Lindbergh kidnapping, I went back to fear, narcissism, need, the conviction that you cannot, the system is rigged and you can't get what you need unless you remove somebody from the equation. Um, I, I too think uh, anyone can be a murderer under the right circumstances, but I think there's a um, kind of a trajectory. This, this can be a, um, a good person on the worst day, doing the worst thing on the worst day of their life, all the way to um, someone who gets real pleasure out of killing and, and doesn't need much more of, of a motive than you, you cut them off at, at the exit. Um, have you ever written a serial killer? I have not written a serial killer, but um, one of the bad guys in my first book is uh, a historical character who was a sociopath. And, and did get a lot of pleasure out of killing people. I found, I found it very unsatisfactory, so I want to know. Unsatisfactory? What do you mean? I, I, I wrote one serial killer, and he was, it was fine, and I gave him a narrative, but I thought serial killers in general are not this coherent 
and their narrative is not that clear and it's so much more instinct and impulse, mm. I think, I suspect. So I'm just curious if anybody has created a good fictional one. Yeah, I, I, I don't write, sometimes there are two murders, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, third book in my, in my Africa series, there are two murders and there are two murderers. Uh, but I, I'm kind of tired of the serial killer. Uh, they, they start to be, get repetitious. And I have a friend who, who uh, uh, teases, she says she never wears uh, lingerie that matches uh, because uh, uh, that's, those are the people that serial killers kill. <laughs> Uh, they, uh, and I, I like that as a joke because because there are so there are so uh, many TV shows where there's a serial killer and there you know there's going to be another and then you, after a while you start spotting this person is going to be the next victim and and it, and it's just the same old same old to me. Uh, one of the, I I know I uh, I don't have fans of my pantsing. Uh, and on this panel, but uh, one of the things that happens with me is that who would, who did it surprised me. So if I figure if I can surprise myself, I might be able to surprise you too. Yeah. Um, we we've got a few more minutes. I think I'm going to ask one more question and then open it up to the audience, and that will be, what are you working on now? What uh, new thing are you working on now if you have ener any energy to do it while uh, the Lindbergh nanny is about to come out? Well, I just turned in a manuscript. <laughs> um, it, it's another uh, true crime uh, novel. Uh, this one I took many more liberties with. It's the murder of a the man that H.L. Mencken said was the greatest American novelist in 1911. You will not know his name. His name is David Graham Phillips. And he, did, did anyone know his name? No. Um, somebody named David. <laughs> <laughs> he was shot six times uh, near Gramercy Park outside the Princeton Club. He was a very flamboyant uh, character with wore white all the time, an enormous chrysanthemum. Um, and uh, the person who is going to solve his murder is a middle-aged writer who is in New York, and she has gathered a few friends named Henry James and Walter Berry and Morton Fullerton together to decide if she should leave America, her publisher, and her husband. And it's Edith Wharton. So that was, that was huge fun to write. I, I'm looking forward to when it comes out. Sounds awesome. Uh, I have uh, one book that's finished. I hope uh, that's with my um, with my agent now, and it's a whole new new thing for me. And it is um, it takes place in my ancestral city of Siracusa in Sicily in uh, 1692-93, and uh, so I'm going back to the 17th century with that one. Uh, and right now, what I'm working on is, as I said, the fifth book in the Africa series, and it's 19. It's they start 1911, 1912, but and they're and they're the uh, the commandments, strange gods, uh, uh, the idol of Mombasa. Uh, the fifth one uh, is, uh, I, I hope, uh, going to be finished soon, and it's 1915, uh, and it's. And World War One is on, so it's a it's a uh, it's the first of of war novels for that series. Fabulous, and I'm I'm working on the third book in my uh, Revolutionary War mystery series. Uh, Becca and Daniel find themselves in Paris with Benjamin Franklin. They think they are done with uh, spying and the American Revolution, and they are wrong. How did they get around the shack? Yes. Uh, Becca is bringing uh, her chaperones with her. Have no fear. Um, any questions? Can we do an applause? Oh, yes. Yeah.
set, then I'm at Lindenberg Yang again, George Caldwell. Uh, he was uh, Hopewell, Hopewell, New Jersey, near Princeton um, and Englewood. They part of the reason that the police believed it was an inside job was that the house in Hopewell was only partly finished and the family only used it on the weekends. Um, and most of the time they lived with Anne's mother, uh, where Betty was um, that Monday, except Charlie had gotten sick and Anne had caught his cold. So she thought, Tuesday, we can stay another day. I'm going to call Betty. I'm going to bring her down. Um, the family was, that was the first Tuesday they'd ever spent in the house. And the, when Betty changed her plans was the first time that anybody outside the family knew that they would be in this very remote, unguarded uh, place. So um, because of COVID, I, I, you can't go to the Hopo house anymore. It's a, um, it's a uh, young person's rehab facility and you can't get close to it. Um, and I haven't made it out to Englewood, um, but uh, I mean, yes, Englewood. Um, so I didn't, but certainly for the New York uh, series, I'm born and bred in New York and it's just wonderful to sort of rattle all around the city. Oxymoron of a true crime fiction is something. How far can you stretch that? I mean, for instance, there was a man who was, as you, we all know, who was sent to jail for life for the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby. And obviously, you don't think he's the killer or the kidnapper. Uh, no, I do believe he was the kidnapper. I do. Yes, I do. The question that the book poses is who was the person on the inside who called to tell him where the, that the Limbergs were in the Hopewell house? Um, so I tr because the, the crime is so well studied and there are legions of armchair scholars uh, on this book, I really stuck as closely to the history as I could. Um, and because I do propose a theory and it's not fun if I haven't, you know, done the, if I haven't gone with the facts on the ground. And, and that's what I was going to add. If I remember right, you have a great author's note oh, in your, yeah, in your book true. about what's true and, and where your theory starts. Yeah. Sure. I sometimes put something in, uh, and once I put it at the beginning and another time at the end, uh, there is a note about what is true and what's not true about Evita, and because Evita speaks in the in the in the book, uh, otherwise uh, I don't because I stick pretty closely to what's really going on in the background history, um, but I haven't tried to solve a real crime in any of my in any of my novels, um, and I. And I get a little bit, um, uh, once I was on a panel with a historical novelist at the Historical Novel Society convention, and she, it sounded like her book was gonna be so interesting and I bought it, but it started with 14 pages of analysis of what was true and what wasn't true in the story I hadn't read yet. Uh, the book is on my bookshelf, I haven't read the book. I. I, um, I didn't have a historical note in the first book. I did for the second. Um, and, and I used a broad brush to say what was true. true, And I limited that to the events upon which the plot turns, you know, not, not everything. 
um, you know, include the first the first woman's group in North America, um, which raised money at every house in Philadelphia that I'd, I'd never heard of, um, things like that. Or, or the status of slavery in Philadelphia since Pennsylvania passed the first law in 1780 to limit slavery. So things I thought, things that interested me that I thought would interest other people are in the notes. So it's short and it's at the end. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that I'd be afraid that if I, I'd be afraid that if I explain too much, uh, I would lose the reader. Uh, and and I, I, I and because that woman lost me and and I'm uh, a big fan so with the Jane Prescott books I always said here were the books I used to research so if people want to delve deeper and then with this as I say um, I went through all the books that I used and here's what I got from here and here's and here are the two major things that I made up. Um, so I think to give your readers credit, they know they're reading fiction and they have to live in dialogue. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, yeah. But I try not to try their patience too much. Like I try not to like somebody like Charles Lindbergh. I was I was really careful that if he didn't say something like that at, at this stage in his life, I didn't put it in. Um, so I, I, I tried to be careful. Yeah, I think you have to be careful with historical, uh, real people. Uh, and I'm so devoted to being right about that, that my, my first novel, City of Silver, takes place in Potosi in 1650. And the alcalde, the mayor, his name was Francisco de la Rocha. And that was a real person. And in the story, he does all the things that the real guy does. But in the end, he does something really heinous that the real guy didn't do. I changed his name. There may be nobody who would care. It took me a long time because Francisco de la Rocha is such a great name for a bad guy. <laughs> Fiction with just a little bit of fat? I think um, you know, fat can have a couple of, of meanings. You can I think you can include few historical events in a historical novel, but you still have to get the clothing, um, the manners, kind of the social history right, or you're gonna I think you're gonna lose your audience. Yeah, you know, yeah. people will pick that up or, or diction, you know, you can't, it, it can be so hard to weed out words that wouldn't have been used in, in the day. Um, and I think that's important. So yeah, you can, you can have, there's a lot of historical fiction and mysteries with fewer historical events in them. There is a fabulous, um, program google n n dash search where you can enter a word and they will tell you how many times it's been used um in a particular where they can find it in books so if you don't see nerds in 1910 then you know i can't have a character say nerds um, yeah except that sometimes it's true but it would not seem True. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and in uh, in Strange Gods, uh, I I read uh, when I first started the Africa series. I read a book by an actual policeman. I love mm -hmm. memoirs uh, mm -hmm. by an actual policeman with feet on the ground at the time, and he told a story about himself. And he's and he said uh, that these people got the drop on him, and I used that story as an inspiration for something that happens to Justin Tolliver in chapter two. Uh, but I didn't, I couldn't use the word got the drop on him, even though they used it in that time. And I knew they did because it would seem like an anachronism. So sometimes yeah. you, you, we, 
you know, it seems it has to seem old, <laughs> even <laughs> even if uh, even if it isn't. I'm just kind of curious, you know, the last couple of years have been trying a lot of emphasis on health and all that, but uh, has it been good for writers? Has it been good for you, in a sense? In isolating and focusing on books. In terms of uh, readership, I think it's been a little bit of a challenge because people, I don't i don't know about people here, but I love going into a bookstore and seeing that big front table. And Lee Child once said, you are eight times more likely to buy a book if you can pick it up and thumb through it. You know, you go to Amazon, you know what you're looking for, more or less. So I think that that's been a challenge. Um, I am, I've been writing full time for like almost 20 years. So I, I'm pretty disciplined. Um, but yeah, I mean, in some ways the dialing down the social life was, was a plus if, if you could blot out all the stress. Um, uh, I changed the last 50 pages of my book because the first ending of my COVID book the second book was so depressing. Once I reread it, I had a, I had to tear it up, and I did. It's much better now. It's wonderful that we can laugh at that. Yeah, uh, I, it was, it was a plus for me. I finished the Sicilian book, and I thought that would take years. Uh, uh, and and, uh, but I, I was on solitary confinement. I was uh, stuck in my uh, alone in my apartment in New York for one year and one week without ever being in a room with another person I could touch. And it was pretty awful. So my, my way to do that was to spend all my time with my imaginary friends. But I spent a little bit too much time. And, I, and, and now I can't sit at the computer for very long because I, I, uh, I did something crazy to my, uh, to my nerve endings. And I have to get up and walk around a lot uh, because I didn't get up and walk around enough. Uh, I was, however, more productive. I was, uh, I was, uh, I live alone, and and I have, uh, and and I stayed away from other people, not because I was afraid for myself, but because I, I came back from, uh, from Italy when it was the, 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 the worst place on earth uh, for COVID. And I live in New York City, which was at the beginning uh, in that March when I came home, the worst place. So uh, I was keeping myself safe and I also didn't, until I was vaccinated, I didn't want to c carry anything to other people. Um, I, w I learned to use Zoom, and I Zoomed with people. Uh, and I, I wasn't without um, did, uh, 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 I wasn't without company, but it was, it was not with a person uh, in a room with me. And I grew up in a, in a very, noisy, very large Italian-American family, it was not easy for me to be alone. I would think anybody who picked up like the Jane Prescott 1910s series, I mean, they're very careful in the, in the promotion to say, if you like Downton Abbey, if you like Gilded Age. Um, so I think probably they have some, I get not so much of the history, but maybe they just enjoy the era, you know, they've been to Newport or something like, I mean, because there are a range of historical mystery. I think, all of us are pretty history heavy, I think. But, you know, obviously there are people who are like, yeah, it's the dresses, it's the gender code, it's the courtship rituals. And so they're, they're lighter uh, versions. Um, and, you know, some people love Austin times or, you know, uh, Victorian. Uh, with Lindbergh, I, it, 
it's really interesting because I've gotten a lot of early reads on it, and it ranges from I'm completely obsessed with this case to I didn't really know a lot about this case. So, um, so, so far it's been a range for me. Oh, well, I think I totally agree with Emma that all my early education was, you know, Philippa Gregory and Jean Plavy and people and C Catherine. I remember that one. And yeah, no, it's the best way to learn. So. I, I assume my readers know as little about the American Revolution as I did when I thought I knew about it. Um, and that's a fine, fine place to start because our books may be history heavy, but they're about characters because that's what novels are. Yeah, yeah it, it, it seems to me. Uh, I started writing about uh, two places in South America that most people don't know anything about. And there are people who are really interested in that way. And I am interested in that way. Uh, but I know that um, when historical novels become popular, uh, not necessarily just good, they're good, it's certainly they are, but it's usually about uh, things that people know something about and are interested in. I can't wait to read uh, <laughs> about this Lindbergh baby, uh, uh, especially since my parents lived in Hopewell, New Jersey for a while. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to, I want to read that. Um, uh, I don't know whether it was a mistake to write about completely unknown places. Uh, the Africa series, my, like your uh, publisher, my publisher wants to, and they, and they, uh, introduced it as um, Agatha Christie meets out of Africa. Well, we want to thank you all for um, hanging with us. You're great. And wonderful questions. I I once proposed um, to Harper Collins, and I'm going to shame them for not accepting this idea. I said we should do young, like royal young people who die, a whole book of you know that those stories. And they said, no, that's horrible. No child would read that. And I said, I would have read that in a heartbeat. <laughs> so. Um, you know, there, oh, there are terrific books. Actually, there's a terrific graphic novel uh, series, and I'm, he started with Nathan Hale, and I do not remember the guy's name, uh, but they're terrific. They're thick, they're fact-filled, um, but they move fast. Um, so, you know, it's tough to talk publishers into it, but I know the market is there. <laughs> You're right. We need some historic true crime blog uh, podcasts. That's what we need. Thank you. Well, thank you again. And the only thing I would add is if you do read our books, whether you buy them here or read them in the library, if you like them and can honestly give them a four or five stars, we'd love it if you left that on BookBub or Goodreads or Amazon. So thank you. If you have a friend who would like one of these books, Christmas is coming and you can get a signed copy. <laughs> <laughs>